our um, art and letters reading group. Um, today's book we're going to be discussing is This is What I Know About Art by Kimberly Drew. My name is Cassandra Cavins, and I am the development assistant for the Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts. Um, this book was short but good, um, so I hope everybody had a chance to read it. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought it was very interesting. I thought that Drew brought up um, a lot of interesting points and uh, viewpoints on the art world in general. Um, but So in case you haven't read the book or know much about who Kimberly Drew is, I'm gonna give you a little bit of the background. Then we're gonna talk um, about some themes throughout uh, the book. Um, we will not be really discussing artwork in general. Um, we're not going to look at images or anything like that today. We're going to talk more about um, the theories behind what Kimberly Drew put forth in her book. Um, so Kimberly Drew, she was born in uh, New Jersey and she currently lives and works in and around the New York City area. And she is a um, curator of Black experiences and culture. And so she uses that term very broadly um, in terms of describing herself and how she sees what she does in the world. Um, she's worked in a variety of museums. She has a bachelor's of art um, with a concentration um, in museum studies as well. And Africana Studies um, from Smith College. And what I think is interesting about Kimberly Drew is that she entered the art world um, in, in a kind of unique way. She got an internship um, while she was actually studying mathematics. So she thought she originally wanted to be some kind of doctor or engineer or something along those lines that typically make um, you know, as she put it in the book, a valued um, contribution to society. But after getting the internship, she realized that there's more than one way to make a contribution to society. Um, and so I want to start out a little bit with this quote that you all see. Um, she says, simply, I want to share my story with the hope that you may find your own journey and make the changes that you want to see in the world. And I really think that kind of carries through this book. Um, she explains her personal and professional uh, journey in the art world. And for me, at least, I was able to kind of understand where she was coming from, but also see how the way in which she dealt with things could then help me deal with things in my own way. So, um, To give you a little bit of background about her um, job experience in her sophomore year in college at Smith College, she had an internship at Studio Museum in Harlem. In 2011, she started Black Contemporary Art Blog on Tumblr. In 2012, she had another internship at Creative Time, and she began using her personal Instagram account to share Black art with the world. In 2013, she became the social media manager for Studio Museum in Harlem. 2014, she became an assistant for a private gallery. And then in 2015, she became the associate online community producer for the Metropolitan Museum of Art. She stayed with the Metropolitan Museum of Art for three years. Then she broke away and she started um, her journey as an author. And so her first book out, which is this book, This Is What I Know About Art, it came out in June 2020. She has another book um, that she co-authored, um, which comes out sometime this fall, I believe it's in November. Um, and I'm interested to see what she does with that because she is um, co-authoring with a journalist. So that should be an interesting take. It's called Black Future. Black what? Black Futures. Futures. Mm -hmm. And so as we move through this um, 
presentation. I want you all to feel comfortable if you have a question um, to ask it as we go along because I don't want you to have to wait necessarily to the end. There, of course, is going to be a discussion portion at the end. But, um, you know, if there's something that you really are curious about or something that I say, um, go ahead and say it in the moment because I think it might make it a little bit more relevant and a little bit more um, understandable if we talk about it at that junction. So let's get started. So Blackness in American Art. There's this great quote um, by Langston Hughes. It says, it is the duty of the younger Negro artist to change through the force of his art that old whispering, I want to be white, hidden in the aspirations of his people. To why should I be white? I am a Negro and beautiful. And, you know, I think this quote really kind of speaks to what Drew talks about in terms of um, the way in which she encountered African American artists or Black artists. Um, they were only in the context of the larger narrative or the already shaped narrative of um, American art to be white. And, you know, you had to juxtapose um, a black artist against a white artist to, to understand. She wasn't really exposed to a lot of black artists um, whether that was through, you know, her beginnings as a museum goer when she was little, or when she turned and became an art history major, or when she started working. Um, none of these really gave her an opportunity to experience um, Black artists, um, other than, of course, you know, the few widely known Black artists of the time that kind of were handpicked to be that the quintessential example of Black yeah. art. And what I think is interesting is that um, on page 22, she talks about not wanting to have the erasure of Black artists because she's not finding it in her life or in her academic career. And she wants to ensure that people of you know, every generation and of every walk of life understand that black artists, you know, have been here, they're here now, and they're going to be, you know, continue to be here. And, um, you know, so she starts an Instagram um, page, she starts her blog, she really tries to get it out there in front of people that, um, you know, this is kind of her um, way of saying, hey, we're here, and, you know, you need to take notice, these are amazing works. Um, you know, but then, on page 25, she talks about Blackness kind of fitting into the overall narrative, and, and it can only fit in a certain way. If people of color, and particularly Black artists, show a negative side or something contradictory to what is considered the norm, uh, you know, it's often met with um, hesitation, reservation, and then, of course, you know, the key phrase people always hear today, um, white guilt. And I, th I think that her point through this is that we don't necessarily um, need to structure the conversation of Black artists around what it does to um, people who are experiencing it um, that may feel this guilt. Rather, we need to explore um, why that guilt is there in the first place, and how Black artists um, really truly tell the story of America. And you know what I think is great about this concept is that, you know, Black artists tell the story of America through a different lens, but it's still a story of America. Um, you know, like the National Museum of African American History and Culture, their, you know, their kind of motto is that they're telling the story of America. It's just through the African American lens. And I think that's what um, Kimberly Drew is trying to get at, is that Black artists are doing the same thing here, that they are contributing to society, that they're trying to tell the story of their culture, um, but also the story of our nation. And I think that that's, you know, a really great um, message 
that is kind of carried throughout this whole book and something that I hope that people um, can understand and can kind of do something with. And and so, so, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Um, with your invitation to jump in, with everything you're saying and with the Langston Hughes quote you brought in, um, Bridget Cooks, when she writes about Jeep Ben quilts, writes about how we all want to take those and say they're European modern paintings. But they're quilts by Americans who are expressing ecstatic religiosity. And, um, you know, when we take that step back and think of how we even do it in our own state, um, it's, it's, it's so refreshing um, for you to draw us back and Kimberly Drew and, and um, Bridget as well. And this, we've had a lot of eye-opening moments lately, but Elizabeth and I were talking about when we read this book, we were both looking up artists. Um, and we were both, you know, learning new artists, even though we supposedly have art history degrees, that even in this tiny little book, there were so many people we, we didn't know about. Yeah, I think that's one of the great things about this book is that, you know, at, early on in the book, she encourages people to step away when they encounter a name that they don't know, like take the time to look it up, Google the person, see what they're doing, see what their work is. Um, and I think that's great because that's the, the way in which, you know, people become more aware of what's out there. And her encouraging us to do that, um, I think is another step in the right direction, you know, not just naming all these people and assuming that you should know who they are, but saying, it's okay that you don't, but please take the time to go look. Like, the only way that we can move this conversation forward is to be able to do that. George? Uh, I had the same experience as Alice did uh, in reading the book. I'm seeing the names of all these artists, um, most of whom I did not know. So I started Googling and seeing uh, rep, uh, reproductions of their works and, uh, you know, uh, I thought that was great. I, I was, as I was reading, I was wishing she would, you know, give some examples of their works, but this is in a way, you know, she uh, cleared the path <laughs> for me to do that on my own. Uh, I'm wondering if I might uh, right now just introduce another name of a young uh, African-American artist who I discovered uh, at the Denver Art Museum last summer. Her name is Jordan Castile, and uh, I did not know of her. Does, does anyone, is anyone familiar with her work? I am not, but I will look her up. Okay, yeah, she is from Denver originally. She now works out of New York. She attended, uh, she got uh, uh, a, I believe a master's in painting at Yale, but, her work is truly astounding. She does mainly portraits. Uh, this is the catalog uh, that I bought. And uh, the, the name of the exhibition was called The, the uh, Returning the Gaze. And you can really see why from some of her portraits. Uh, generally, the people are looking right out at you. Uh, her use of color is wonderful uh, and she is just painting portraits of people she knows or meets on the street, but they are so vibrant uh, and just really captures the humanity of their subjects. Uh, so I just wanted to give her some recognition and hopefully pass it on to some of you who might be interested. So well, thank you. I will definitely um, take the opportunity to look her up and find out more about her. Cookie, did you have something to add? Yes, I want to share this book. Uh, it is written and illustrated by a wonderful Black artist named K-A-D-I-R K K Nelson. Kadir. It's called Heart and Soul. I have not read the book that we're talking about. So I don't know if he's in that book or not, but this is the book that I'm going to, that 
like you were saying, uh, it it's not only telling Black history, but it's telling the story of America from the Black history point of view. And uh, I would say this is like uh, uh, age elementary and junior high. Uh, and I'm putting it in the Wetumpka Library in memory of John Lewis. Wow. Yeah, I'm seeing two. I'm seeing two Coretta Scott King awards on that. So yes, yeah, he's yeah. very, very good. Um, so I think one of the reasons she had us look up black artists instead of presenting that work to us is that she wants us to get used to the idea that we should go and we should be looking for these artists on a regular basis and not just being fed them because we've been fed so many artists already and guess what happens when we get fed artists they mostly tend to be white dead men <laughs> hey. i completely agree Amy. i think you know that by allowing the reader the choice to go and find out more about the artist it's it's her invitation to say, you know, if if you're so inclined, if you want to, here's how to do it. Go look them up. Um, and I think it's really kind of more of a way to say, you know, like you said, we're not we're not gonna feed it to you, mm -hmm. but rather we want you to have the desire to learn. Yes. Yeah, it's not just an invitation. It's it's sort of a, a very strong suggestion that this is something you should be doing. You shouldn't yeah. be relying on traditional education alone. You should be responsible in some cases. And because traditional education has denied us some of these amazing artists, uh, here's here's a couple to start you on. But hey, go go look for artists because how many of you can name a black artist in Montgomery? Because we have them. We have so many. Most of them. Charlie Lucas is over in Selma. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but we have some right here in this city. I oh, know, but that's the one I like the most. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, and I think speaking of that, you know, she touches on the fact that when she was in school and she was studying art history that you know, she wasn't exposed to, to Black artists. It was always, um, you know, like you said, white males. And that, you know, that kind of brings us into the next portion of this, which is talking about why does race matter, right? When, when why do people even bother writing about this topic? Um, you know, why does Bridget Cook have a book called Exhibiting Blackness? Like, why are these things talked about? And I think, um, you know, this graph clearly shows it. Um, artist representation. There was a study done in 2019 called the diversity of artists in major U.S. museums. Um, and it surveyed the top 18 museums um, in the U.S. for artist representation. And as you can see in their collections, 85.4% of their collections are white. 9% are Asian, 2.8 are Hispanic or, Hispanic or Latinx, 1.2 are Black, and 1.5 are other ethnicity. So this is really why we're talking about this. This is why, you know, Bridget Cook had her book. This is why Kimberly Drew, you know, wrote this book. It's because the proportion to which um, we hold African or Black, African American or Black, um, art as, you know, highly val valuable um, in esteem compared to the way in which we regard um, white art is drastically, or is vastly um, unproportionate. And we need to do a much, much, much better job of making our collections in museums um, more representative of our nation as a whole and more representative of our um, community. You know, we don't live. Hmm. No. <laughs> lost the video, lost the audio. Yeah, yeah we did. Can, can't hear. Lost your audio. 
much. What are you barking about, huh? Mm -hmm. Stabbing you with your bony leg. Huh? <laughs> Oops. Hi, Carol. Oh, hello. Oh, look who you got with you. <laughs> I got this is Sparky. This is my son's dog. I brought him home from Las Vegas. Wow. Did I cut out? I think I cut out. Yeah, you did. You did. Okay. Um, so anyways, you know, I just think that we all need to do um there we go. Let me share this again so we can all see. Okay. Oops. Oh, not again. No, okay. she's still here. So I, I hope that this kind of um illustration really helps people to put in perspective you know, where we're at as a society and where we're at um, in terms of thinking about what we deem as fine arts. Well, what is the, the percentages in the Montgomery Museum of these ethnic groups? That's a good question. Um, actually, Stephen, um, our digital media manager, and myself this morning were discussing that. And, you know, we were, we were talking about how we need to do some um, analysis of our own collection to find out what our actual percentages are to be able to kind of get a baseline and help us move forward in being more proactive in um, not looking like this. So I, I know that there are some museums have, who have actually uh, declared that they will not be buying any white art, I think for a couple of years. I can't remember which ones. I think Boston might have been one of them. Is that is that an approach that Montgomery would be interested in taking? You know, that's a good question. And I think that, you know, um, it's, it's one of those things where, as a museum, we oftentimes um, want to look to our peer museums and to you know, our flagship museums to see what they're doing and to see whether or not, you know, we can kind of go along the same path. Um, in regards to only purchasing um, works that are not from uh, white artists, that is more of a curatorial question, which I'm not 100% sure on. So I don't want to, you know, take um, a step towards that direction with this answer, as I truly don't know. Um, <laughs> That's a good answer. I'm I'm one of those people they don't like to have around because I ask hard questions. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's not a hard question. I just I'm not in curatorial. So well, if Amy, I was, I probably could give you the answer. Amy, what we can answer is that our most two recent purchases um, are about uh, experience of people of color and activism in the United States. You know, like Cassandra said, she neither she nor I works in that department. But those are, have been our most two recent acquisitions and some of our um, other significant acquisitions in the past year have been back to the G's Ben Quilter um, reference I made earlier and um, some of the other Alabama artists um, that people have mentioned, um, Thornton Dahl and, and others. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Right, Alice. And you know, and I think too that um, to kind of piggyback off what Alice was saying is that, you know, I think the museum has an eye towards um, acquiring more works to make our uh, collection more representative of the people in, in the area in which we live. Um, you know, with the new uh, strategic plan in place and our new, you know, mission and vision um, going forward, we're really trying to be um, more representative and to truly be more inclusive. And of course, you know, that's not going to be an overnight process, no. but we are um, all here to work towards that goal and towards that end. And so speaking of which, um, uh, Kimberly Drew also talks about in her book um, the fact that 
when she worked at Creative Time, she was, you know, one of five African Americans that worked um, at the museum or at the um, public arts organization and that there was only one that was actually a full-time person. And so to continue our discussion about why does race matter, we also have to look at um, the people who are hired to care for, collect, um, and educate around these um, artifacts and, um, and art. And so in um, 20, 18, there was a survey taken um, from the Art Museum Staff Demographic Survey, which was conducted by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, ISCA SR, the Association of Art Museum Directors, and the Alliance of American um, Museums. And one of the finds that they found was that from 2014 to 2018, um, new hiring uh, by race and ethnicity, so curators and educators, um, are in blue and the museum leadership and conservation are in the gray color. And as you know, the chart clearly indicates that from those four years, um, there was a much higher hiring rate of um, white candidates than there was of any other uh, race. And you know, that's not to say that there weren't people that were qualified. Um, or were not qualified, but it's to say that the majority of people being hired in the field are still white. And I think what Kimberly Drew's book points to is that um, having people who are of that particular race uh, talk about that race helps to broaden the story and deepen the story. And, you know, I think we really need to think about um, our hiring practices and think about the ways in which we interact with art um, from various cultures and try to be really cognizant of the fact that, you know, we're telling people's stories and we want to get it right and we want to um, be inclusive as much as possible. And for me, one of the things that um, Kimberly Drew said in her book was that, you know, she needed to make sure she had the right people at the table. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's so true on so many different levels, whether that's hiring people who can create a diverse staff, or if that's, you know, engaging with your community and letting them have a seat at the table and have a seat at, you know, um, at the discussion from the outset. So that way, when you go forward, you can create a um, more holistic view. You know, I think all of that is important. And I think this is another reason why, we, you know, we have to continue to talk about it because, um, you know, as, as Kimberly Drew had stated, she said, you know, she felt so, um, you know, honored to kind of be let into this elite world. And I feel like there's a lot of people who kind of feel that way, whether you're white, you're black, um, you're Asian, whatever, you know, if you're, if you're not from this quote unquote art world or museum world, um, it can kind of be intimidating. And I think we need to do a better job of, of making sure that people understand that, you know, while art is not for everyone, art is for anyone. And, you know, I think that that's truly something that we all need to work towards, whether you're in the profession or if you're just a person who loves art, you know, let people know it. it's, it's for anyone. Oops. Okay. Did we have any comments on that one? I want to give people time. No. Just the idea that if we can't make art available on our walls that everyone can relate to. Why are we here? If it's a secret code, what's the point? And I, I think that's important. You know, it's the thing that um, is very interesting to me about Kimberly Drew as um, kind of just a person, the route that she took was to like make it both professional and personal. Like, you know, not only did she create an outward facing, you know, um, this, this black art movement or these black artists are important, 
but she did it personally too through her own Instagram account, through a blog that she created. She was try really trying to embody and embrace um, this idea holistically. And I think it's important that we understand, you know, that it's, it's something that we all want to relate to. Um, you know, we all need to be able to walk into a place and see ourselves in it somehow, some way. Um, if not, like Alice said, why would you go there? Why, like, why would you even walk through the door? What, what possible value could it have to your life? And if, you know, we can be what Lonnie Bunch says we should be, which is, you know, um, at the, at the center of our community, well, then we have to be of value to people and to be of value to people means they have to see themselves. And so I think, you know, we have to do a better job of making sure that people see themselves in the staff that they interact with, that they see themselves in the art on the walls, that they see themselves um, in the people that are speaking um, and are asked to represent the mu museums or organizations in several ways. Um, you know, I think we have to all do a better job of that. And I think that's something that Kimberly Drew really kind of points to. Now, you know, this book was only what, 64 pages or something like that. It was very short. Um, but it, what I think is interesting is how she packed so much into that, that short little time frame. And, you know, one of the things she talks about is art and activism. And I think that's something that here, you know, we at the museum here are kind of starting to um, get a little bit more involved in, you know, we've had some new programming that have, has been really successful. And, um, you know, I think that you cannot separate out art and activism because artists are recording their views on their society. And so oftentimes that le lends its way or leans its way over to activism, especially in today's world um, and what's going on in today's world. You know, it's very reminiscent to what she was talking about in her book when she was talking about um, Eric Garner or, um, you know, all the other people in the book that she talks about that were killed by police, police brutality and how that for her cemented art and activism together and how she could utilize art and utilize her organization's platform um, to give a voice to the voiceless. And, you know, I think that a lot of people um, kind of underestimate the power. I mean, they say, what's the, what's the old adage, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. And so I believe that, you know, we truly um, study art and we cherish art and we preserve art because art is the visual record of our history. So if art is the visual record of our history, then we need to make sure that it is representative of that whole history. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Okay, so that's kind of where I kind of landed. So, <laughs> Cassandra, what was your little survey for? Which one? Oh, yes. So the one that you all took beforehand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was kind of um, my way of getting you all to think about some themes and some different areas that I kind of found interesting or important um, about throughout the book. And so, you know, the last portion of this, I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the some of the questions in that survey. So basically key insights for this book, I found, you know, we still have a lot of work to do. We still have a lot of progress to make. And, um, you know, we can't stop uh, where we're at and get complacent because um, we're nowhere near where we need to be. That was kind of my key insight from the book. 
but discussion and Q&A. So this is the, the part where I wanted to talk about that survey. So how, how many of you um, uh, went to museums when you were younger? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I can't see everyone. Yes, yes. Let me show this. Okay. But depends, so depending on- There's a fair amount. Cassandra, um, Cassandra yes. depending on where we grew up, if you did not grow up in a larger town, it wasn't as easy to go to museums as if you were in a larger city. Yes, that's true. I mean, you know, that I, I feel like that's still true today. Like, yeah. there's a lot of um, hurdles to be able to get to a museum. Right. Um, you know, take us, for example. We're in a city. We're in Montgomery, but yet we're not downtown. You know, so yeah. people yeah. still have transportation issues to get to us over here at Blount Cultural Park. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, just everyday typical logistical barriers to actually getting to a museum. Uh, there are and I think people on my side of town where I work who have not been there and they, when they find out that it's free as well, they're shocked. They're yeah, shocked. That's true. Well, when I was growing up, we didn't even think about museums. I didn't know about museums till I was in high school. Yeah, yeah. When, when I was growing up, the museum was uh, associated with the library. And since we went to the library, then we would go upstairs and see what was in the museum. So that's yes. how I got exposed. And I do think, too, uh, maybe art museums were used more for research than for pleasure. Um, depending on where you lived and what you were doing? Well, in, in our situation, museums were for the elite people. You had to dress up, you had to behave <laughs> yourself. <laughs> you know, it was that kind of a thing for us when I was growing up. We had to go out of town to go to a museum, so it, it just didn't happen. Well, I'm so old, we even wore heels and dresses <laughs> Oh. To the football games when I went to SNU in the 1960s. So, yeah. Oh, well, I was like, I, that sounds I, awful. I am so glad <laughs> I was not born in that time. I am not that kind of woman. And Amy, who was speaking, uh, bringing back to what Cookie was saying, we have reconnected with the library, and Amy is our representative from the library, though we're no longer in the same building, we're back in the same reading group. And, and thank you so much, Amy. Oh, no problem. You know, I, I think it's interesting, you know, that a lot of you are saying like, oh, well, you know, the museum was for the elite, you know, back when I was younger. I, it's funny because museums are often still viewed the same way today. Like museums are still for the elite, like, yes, you know, you don't have to dress up in, in, you know, fancy clothes or anything like that anymore. People know, like, they can walk in in their streetwear, but it's that idea of that intimidation of what am I walking into? Um, you know, is someone going to judge me because I don't know what's on the wall? Because I can't understand what this contemporary art is. Um, you know, all of those things, and they're all real barriers that us as museum professionals have to work um, to, to make sure that we're trying to be as inclusive as possible and be as opening and as welcoming as possible because we want to share what we have on our walls, um, you know, with, with the world and we want people to be able to um, enjoy these beautiful works of art and, you know, not feel like they don't belong. And, you know, so I feel like in some ways, you know, we have come far, but in other ways, we're still kind of where we were. <laughs> and I think, you know, we have, we have ways to go. Because Cassandra, we yeah. read a book last year uh, about the Met. <sighs> and yes, it was owned by the people who started it. So I think really from that idea of this is my museum because of my money, I think we've come a long way from, from that, which, which is good. And that book was very interesting, too, because there were so few women involved yes. in leadership. And such yeah. a strong contrast to how this museum started sometimes you know, as much work as we have to do in Little Old Alabama, sometimes there's some advantage. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, yeah, yeah, y'all yeah, have heard me preach about this, but not being a native of Montgomery. My museum, this museum is a wonderful museum, and, and I know we need to be more inclusive, but what we have is really super duper. Sandra, I've got a comment I wanted to make. Yeah. Um, I, I, I thought this book was a book of empowerment and I got swept up in the, you know, wanting to know more about black artists and how to put black artists on the walls. And then she brought it to a complete stop, I thought, probably purposefully, when she brought in the page and a half about her mother. Mm -hmm. And what she said would just really hit me that she had gone, her brilliant mother had gone two decades without a visit to a museum mm -hmm. and it seemed to have little impact on her life. And then the last thing, I had never stopped to think about what would happen if we did not want to be there. And I thought, you know, she not only, you know, she gives you both sides of the picture, which I think was, uh, it's a great part about this book. But that really struck me about, about her mother, it made me stop and think, not get so caught up in it, that we can't get every black person in Montgomery to come to our museum, nor be even interested in what was on it if they knew what was on the walls. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, you know, I think that's a great point, is that, you know, museums, like art, should be open for everyone. You yes. know, a anybody can walk through these doors, but not everyone's going to want to. And, you know, we have to understand, understand that, be okay with that. Um, as long as we are not, you know, creating barriers for people to not want to come. I think that's the key, and I think that's what she's saying. Like, you know, if if her mother lived all of these years and lived a fulfilling life and never felt like she was lacking something because she wasn't involved mm -hmm. in the art world, um, well, what does that mean? I've never been to the Talladega racetrack, but I, <laughs> I wouldn't mind going. I just I just don't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. And the nice mm -hmm. thing about the Montgomery Museum is you have Meg and you have people that greet you and say, oh, well, you're on, what are you, what are you, we're interested in? Oh, the artworks is this way or the, this is this way. So I, I think our, our museum is, has gotten to be very welcoming. And if anybody knows how to do the Talladega thing, let me know. Because I, <laughs> I die. We can oh, carpool. Yeah. <laughs> we, can't, we can't bring Confederate flags anymore, so don't do that. <laughs> I lived in Georgia. We went to the NASCAR races. <laughs> you know, I think um, that, that idea, Frank, of just going back to that for a minute, um, of, you know, her mother never going and her only, you know, she only went with her father. Uh, I think it's very interesting that she went with her father. Um, you know, instead of her mother, it seems like something that kind of would have been the opposite. Like she would have, yeah. you know, it seems like this is an excursion that you would typically go to with your mother um, as a young person. And I thought about that in terms of my own life and how I was introduced um, into museums. And, you know, the way I think a lot of children in Montgomery are introduced into museums, and that's through field trips. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and not necessarily your parents. Um, I, my parents never stepped into a museum until I became a museum professional. Um, and I stepped into museums through field trips, but I never went on my own until I was in college. And I think there's so many different entry points um, to museums and uh, ways in which people kind of eventually find their way in. Um, that's just so interesting to, to think about. But specifically for Montgomery, I think we need to uh, understand that a lot of our children don't have this exposure to art. Um, you know, our, our education is lacking in Montgomery schools. Um, and, you know, the museum tries its best to kind of bridge that through our, um, you know, tour programs and through some of our other programs that are held at schools. Um, and of course, through our educational opportunities that we do, you know, on a daily basis, but um, to just to be cognizant that people oftentimes when they enter, it's their first time, it's their first experience, it's their first exposure. What, what does that mean and how can we help 
shape it for the rest of their life, I think is an interesting yeah. and important um, question. And I think that's something else that Drew brought up in the book, but she was doing it more through the social media life, which, um, you know, goes back to that survey where I asked, you know, do you follow um, museums that um, are actually on social media, Facebook or Instagram or whatever, um, and do you follow them if they do a poor job? And the majority of people said no. If, if they're not interesting, if they're not captivating, I don't follow them. I don't, I don't look beyond that first time. Um, and I think this is something that Kimberly Drew kind of gets across is that she used that platform in whatever position she was to engage with her audience and to make her audience engage with Black artists. And I feel like that's something that is often a missed opportunity in our field, um, is that we don't necessarily always um, utilize our, our social media presence um, to the best of our abilities. And I'm hoping that through this, you know, craziness of 2020, that it has given us all a chance to kind of get more comfortable with the online platforms and the social media platforms and we all can kind of utilize them a little bit better and connect people um, in a more interesting way to artists to art um, that they may never have seen or may never have thought to seek out Thank you very much. Oh, you're on mute. Sharon, I think Cassandra is trying to tell you you're on mute. Is that better? Yes. <laughs> I was thinking we should need to take over one of these billboards with a family and casual uh, attire, just enjoying going to the museum people are very visual and if they see that they go oh i can go there and i'll be okay you know i don't have to wear my high heels <laughs> Limp, i think brings a lot of people into the museum it's such a fun family thing and then the american indian things that we do the por porch the porch creek that's that brings a lot of families and people that maybe would never go to a museum would come. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I think um, the way in which the museum partners with so many different people um, and so many different organizations really helps to draw new people in that might never have come otherwise. Um, and then they get to experience um, you know, art that they might not have seen otherwise. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about the way in which we approach our work here at the museum is, you know, we truly do take a lot of what Kimberly Drew talks about and creating connections um, to heart here. And, you know, I think that although, you know, of course there's always room for improvement, um, we, I think at this current time are doing you know, I think we're doing a good job and I think we're mm -hmm. always looking towards the, you know, with an eye to the future of what we can do better, where can we expand. Um, and I think if anything that we could take from, you know, Kimberly Drew's book is the fact that we just need to be um, constantly thinking about this idea of representation um, and how does that fit in with us? How does that fit in um, with our community and, you know, where can we go from here, I think really is the overall takeaway that I got from the book. Um, and I'd love to hear kind of what your overall takeaway was. I just want to say one of my favorite events and not just because I participated <laughs> was uh, Montgomery Artists on Tap. Like that is That's really cool. Event. I would love to see more of that because there's no reason why the art museum shouldn't be uh, highlighting more local artists. I didn't get to do that. You know, I wanted to say that I think that uh, artworks 
and the artworks corridor has brought mm -hmm. in a huge diversity of people. Mm -hmm. um, right and I can't, when I was working at the museum, um, I couldn't believe how, how many people would come to artworks corridor and they would just love seeing the student art. And it had to almost encourage them to go in the other part of the museum because they, they love that so much. And, you know, in many museums, student art is shown in the basement or it's <laughs> on the floor and you That's can't right. find it. And, um, you know, this is, I think one of the best things about the museum is that it's right there and a lot of students participate in that from a lot of different schools. It can always increase more, you know, but that brings the parents in to see the art, et cetera. I mean, that's just one more way. Yeah, um, also a uh, way, way to get more foot traffic is when we have open houses and things like that and all these um, uh, choral groups and things like that come and participate, their families come, that's a great way to get more folks in the museum. And you know, Cassandra hasn't really emphasized her own role um, as much today, but I just want to say what a great job she's doing here at such a critical point in this museum's history, trying to make our work and the things we value here available to our community in many ways, but especially through her role as a grant writer, um, she's had just incredible success um, seeking funding with incredible community vision that you've all heard today that really couldn't be more important at this moment in history when everything is so uncertain. So kudos to Cassandra. Well, thank you, Alice. Um, you know, I think, I think it's one of those things where, you know, being in this, this very um, odd, uh, time where, like you said, we don't know what's coming from day to day, um, makes getting what we're doing out there even more important because, you know, we don't know um, how we're affecting everyone's lives. And, and, you know, now that we're all a little bit more comfortable <coughs> on an online platform, um, you know, how have our events, how have our um, offerings, you know, helped to uh, help people who have been on quarantine, you know, like, for instance, I have a friend who is currently on quarantine, and, you know, she loves to be able to look and see what we do um, on our Facebook page, and, you know, she loves our puzzles, and, you know, just those little bit of things help people through the difficult times. And like, you know, all of you guys were saying, there's so many different entry points to the art world and to the museum world. And I'm glad that we're able to kind of captivate it and capture a new audience, um, even though these times are forcing us to, you know, keep our doors closed for the moment, except for the sculpture garden, which is now open. <laughs> So I think that's pretty much our time. Um, I enjoyed this discussion with you all, and I hope that you enjoyed the book. Um, you know, it was short but sweet, and was really powerful and impactful, I thought. Um, and I think it was a great way to kind of kick off uh, the new uh, reading group for the year, because um, it was a little bit of a quick turnaround, so being a short book was a good thing. Um, it gives you guys a little bit more time to read the, the big long summer read um, mm -hmm. <laughs> that comes up next. And you know, I hope that you all continue to um, engage with us and continue to you know read and, and, and cultivate um, new perspectives and you know continue to uh, learn. So thank you all. And thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Yeah. Thank you, Cassandra. Thank this you. is applause, applause, Thanks applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And, Thank and you guys do remember with, that we're open to everyone now, speaking of, and would love yeah. some new members in this reading group. And also check out the blog about the Edward Hopper poems and stories in relation to last meetings um, book or last 
last my month's book. Last year's <laughs> we've done it several times. There, there are a few of you who write for that, and that's a lot of fun that's come out of this break, too. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Parky says bye.